Hi. Hi, Dina. Okay. I don't hear you and I, oh, here is Eugene. Hi. Hi. Hi, Dina. Hi, Anna. Hi, Dina. I couldn't hear Dina and don't see her. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Dina, can you hear us? Oops. Okay. Good. Okay. Having problems. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a sec. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. You're putting the the translation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just preparing not to forget about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, hopefully, Dina can. Dina, can you hear us? Hi. Look like there is, uh, Dina, you know what? If you can hear us, one problem is that you need to update uh, Zoom because if Zoom is old, it will not work. And you need to check it uh, and uh, whether or not you have uh, the latest version of, the, of Zoom. If you can hear us. I hear. Oh. Good, good, good. We can see you. Can you hear us? I'm just fixing my internet. Ah, great, great. Good, good. Because... Yeah. How are you? Fine, fine. How are you? Hmm? Yeah, well, um, a bit better every day. <laughs> Where are you? I'm back in Uganda. So. Oops. Oh, oh. What's going oh. on? <laughs> There's something going on with Eugene now, with his internet or computer. Yeah, mine, mine seems fine now. Yeah, so so mm -hmm. his computer. Uh, hi, Tony. Yeah. yeah. And Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi, Tony. Nice to see you. Hi, <laughs> So very early. <laughs> Hi. I think Eugene will have to reboot his computer, but we will not be canceled. Hi, Tara. Nice hey. to see you. Yeah, lovely, lovely. You know what? In spite of everything, I wanted to make it today because I didn't want to miss this because I've been kind of, you know, I feel so bad every time I see a program I want to attend, but I cannot because it's always tied up with something else. So today, I tell, and even today, it's kind of jinx because, you know, when I calculated three days ago, it was uh, uh, 8.30 Indian time. And uh, today, suddenly, I got a reminder on my Google calendar saying that it's uh, 7.30. So I think I'll have to leave for a little while at 8 o'clock and come back and join. Is that OK? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay, hi Tony, hi Tatara. Sorry, yeah. I have to... oh, oh, lovely to see you. <laughs> How nice. Hi, Eugene. 
Hi, hi. Yeah. I just, for some bizarre reason, I have problem with my internet suddenly, and uh, I don't know what's happened. Hopefully, it will not happen again. Oh. Uh, okay, well, welcome. And, uh, uh, well, Tony, I know that you're in New Zealand, and Dina, mm -hmm. where are you right now? Uganda. We are back home. Uh, in U Uganda. Yeah, I can see. I, I guess that, look at your dress. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather cold here. I know. <laughs> India, here yeah, it's getting warm in India too. Yeah, very, very yeah. warm. Huh? So good. Okay. Well, good. Well, uh, let us start. And um, thanks, mm -hmm. Dina, for organizing this uh, meeting. It's very interesting. Mama. So. Maybe, Dina, you can start uh, just telling Mama. us uh, about, uh, uh, I'll wait, wait a minute, yeah. maybe, maybe we should just introduce each other because uh, from the fact that I know everybody, it doesn't mean that everybody knows each other. <laughs> this is like <laughs> egocentrism <laughs> on my side. So maybe we just like go in the circle and just introduce, uh, uh, starting with maybe Dina with you. So okay. uh, can you tell us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my name is Dina, and I am um, a very interested, I'm a teacher, I'm also very interested in self-directed education. At some point, I was involved in starting a democratic school in Moscow, a little one, and it seems bizarre at the moment. Um, but uh, they are actually still going despite whatever, nobody has noticed them yet. So that's uh, nice. And uh, at the moment, I'm also interested in um, uh, learning how to help people, how to navigate them uh, with their kind of problems with life. So some, a type of coaching. So I'm studying that. And I live in Uganda, I work online and um, a baby will be running around so <laughs> there we go <laughs> and um tara yeah would okay. you like to go next yeah yeah mm -hmm. i'm from india i'm an independent teacher educator and researcher and uh, yeah been interested in this uh, dialogic pedagogy uh, for the potential that it offers uh, for, you know, to make uh, teaching and learning as democratic as possible. And always this question about how much, how democratic can it be and where's the line? This has always been troubling me. And uh, so I've, I've been exploring this. And uh, right now with the pandemic, uh, my involvement with a group of teachers and students who are in uh, different villages all around uh, the city where I live, and so we meet online and uh, these children, they have a, a phone with which they try to connect. And uh, with all the problems that we have, we are trying to uh, keep the group going and uh, uh, with both the teachers and students. And uh, this is an opportunity, not about, you know, like uh, preparing them for exam or anything, it gives us a kind of a leeway to try, uh, you know, what emerges from the students and uh, uh, follow their kind of interests and orientations. And so whatever they want to show, uh, uh, you know, some pictures that they've drawn, something that they, uh, something that's happening in their village or uh, whatever it may be, that becomes the topic and then uh, everybody gets engaged and involved and so this is a very interesting group something that i've never done before and so it's very very uh, kind of uh, interesting and it also also has raised some questions for me and uh, so this is my current preoccupation thank you <laughs> yeah you need to pass tara to somebody oh, oh okay okay and then i pass it to anna <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, uh, I don't know who, who knows me, who doesn't. I am Anna Marianovic Shane. Originally, I'm from Yugoslavia, but I live uh, uh, here in the United States more than half of my life now. And uh, I'm also an independent scholar and teacher. Uh, 
and I only have one little dependency still on the University of Delaware for my internet, uh, university internet address. <laughs> it's the last nerve that they are keeping on me. <laughs> I, I think they'll slowly cut that off too. So <laughs> I'm interested in the... I'm also interested in the, uh, the democratic uh, uh, schooling or self-education, really, which I think is uh, probably only possible in today's day in a democratic schooling or outside of institution completely, and uh, them, uh, dialogic pedagogy. I'm also interested in the various phenomena of play, which I think is a very serious oh. matter. <laughs> okay, that's me. And so now I'm passing to, to Tony. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, I'm Tony Cartner. I'm, um, I'm currently in Hamilton in New Zealand. And uh, uh, as you can probably see from my uh, Gold. Yeah. Like elegant clothing, it's uh, 10 past three in the morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are our hero. <laughs> <laughs> but the weather is all right. It's... Um, it's but, coming into springtime. Okay. So, <laughs> so, sorry, coming into, goodness gracious, coming in, it's autumn, I'm lying. <laughs> it's autumn, it's, winter is approaching. Um, I, um, I first got interested in, 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 uh, in Bakhtinian studies when um, uh, Anna and Eugene came to a conference I was helping to run in Hamilton on, on Bakhtin, um, and that was fun. And, uh, but I'm now doing um, a master's degree in philosophy looking at um, what I would call stabilization, stabilizing conditions of nation states. So I'm interested in from the sort of outside in, in, in the way in which countries like New Zealand, which were the colonies of course, um, um, are stable or not, as the case may be. So I'm just starting a master's degree in philosophy. I think that's me. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, and um, uh, Eugene? Okay, thank you. Anna. Thanks, Tony. Um, well, my name is Eugene Matosov. Originally, I'm from Soviet Union uh, and from Moscow specifically. And right now I'm at the University of Delaware in the United States. Uh, actually, I live in Philadelphia, which is about, it's in the state of Pennsylvania, which is about like one hour away from University of Delaware. And uh, my interest is like many of yours in uh, dialogic pedagogy in dialogue, Bakhtinian version of that, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, that Russian philosopher of dialogue. And also in democratic education, uh, like uh, Anna was talking about self-education, I think that's the uh, genuine education is self-education in different forms of that. And of course, I'm always interested about this possibility and impossibility of dialogue, which is, I guess, uh, um, Dean is interested, especially right now uh, during this uh, terrible time, a uh, terrible war, um, that uh, Russia started in Ukraine. And it's become very difficult for many people, uh, as, but especially people from uh, Russia and uh, like for uh, Dean and for me. So that's, that's why I'm so interested in participation in this uh, discussion, although uh, the same problem actually uh, in maybe less acute but still exist in education and I have some interesting examples of that as well. So I think next person is Anna, Anna K with double N. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry I'm on the road. I'm uh, in Moscow actually right now and uh, I'm also interested in uh, dialogue in education so I work in a non-state uh, sphere of education. I have uh, individual students of uh, languages and I'm also interested in uh, some broader ways uh, to understand education, uh, some meta skills and uh, cognitive skills that embrace 
uh, all different kinds of uh, mental states uh, that evolve, uh, that are involved uh, during education. So I'm very glad to meet you all. And uh, I will probably switch off my camera because uh, so not to irritate you with the changing scenery. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's actually very, no, it's, it's, actually it's quite like interesting. Really yeah. yeah, I know. I think it's quite nice and keep it. Yeah. It's interesting for us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll go now in underground passage so it will not be so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> where exactly are you? I mean, where exactly are you in Moscow? It, yeah, it's uh, Toplistan. If you know, it's uh, south west of Moscow. Okay. So, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've only been to Moscow and Kazan. Oh. No, no. And uh, St. Petersburg, of course. <laughs> this is Russia. That's not Moscow. Moscow is a city, Tara. And, huh? uh, I know. So... Moscow, I know. I've been in Moscow. Uh, uh, and then I've been in St. Petersburg and I've been uh, in Kazan. In okay. three places in uh, I see, Russia. I see. I see. I see. Uh, uh, okay. Well, maybe, Dina, you can start, like, uh, since you're calling for this uh, meeting, so what was your, on your mind when you called for the meeting, Dina? Yeah, so um, last two weeks, uh, the thing on my mind um, with the war has been uh, the fact just stopped being able to talk to each other and within friendships within families everybody just split and i keep hearing that uh, it's absolutely impossible to talk to each other that it's impossible to avoid the topic that it's impossible to talk and not uh, argue that it it is very painful um, like some people are fine to avoid it. I've heard that as well. But for many, it's, um, it turns into an open fight. And yet people still care for each other. They still have the, some history of friendship or it's within the family, sisters, uh, parents. And, um, and it sounds entirely awful. I don't have that personally and I'm very happy about it. Uh, but um, most of the people I know have it with one or more people. And I've just been thinking if there is a, a way to still talk in this kind of situation or is it done? Mm -hmm. yeah. so I'm very interested. What do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you for uh, assigning us a task. <laughs> I'm just, no, no, but actually I'm using. Oh, um, Eugene's uh, frozen. Term for that. Uh, uh, so that's kind of, uh, you know, I, I have terrible internet connection. Let me just I try know. to switch from one to another, but I'm, I'm not sure it will help or not. Um, okay. Just a sec. Yeah. I can just keep talking for a little bit yeah, longer please, while you please. do that. Uh -huh. uh, I keep thinking there must be a way. There must be a way. That's like, um, because it seems so wrong to stop being um, friends or family because of, yes, it's a Does it change everything? Does it nullify everything? I feel like it shouldn't. I feel like I shouldn't stop being friends with someone if he has a different opinion, even if it's something that I think is a horrible opinion. So yeah, but... Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just this, can I jump in? Yeah, just today I got a note from the, you know, one of the persons who was in, uh, in more, uh, a person from UK 
who was um, an editor on a magazine um, in uh, Russia. And then uh, he said that he's resigning and, uh, he's, um, and, and handing it over to uh, the Russian counterpart. And uh, he says, because of the thing. And I thought, you know, in my mind, the thoughts that came to me was, uh, uh, I mean, it's not personal war, you know? I mean, like in the sense, um, I mean, what are, what are you going to prove by doing this kind of a thing? You're building, you're contributing to, uh, uh, you know, this uh, kind of enmity and this kind of uh, uh, division uh, by doing, by such acts. Um, I'm not so sure, you know, from, uh, between people, uh, there is no, uh, what should I say, uh, no quarrel in the sense, you know, it, it's somebody's uh, point of view about what one believes ideologically and even in terms of power. One, uh, some persons, at the, you know, a few people believe and they think that they have the power to, uh, you know, achieve what they think is right. And so they go into this war and they create all this, but for the la for a large number of people, it really is of, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's not what they want. It, they want peaceful existence, coexistence. And so um, uh, by uh, this kind of boycott, I don't know what we achieve. Are we working, I mean, you know, instead of uh, moving towards a dialogue of possibilities, we are trying to estrange ourselves by such activities, I feel. And I, I, I mean, you know, these were the thoughts that came to me today when I read that letter about uh, this person resigning from his, uh, uh, you know, editorship. Well, let, uh, want... let me, uh, oh, oh, Anna, do go ahead, please. I, I also wanted to start with an example first with, before we trying to kind of figure out what, what's going on. But uh, my experience, of course, with this, uh, th this war reminds me of this uh, experience from the 90s when the Yugoslavia was falling apart uh, uh, in a very violent way. And the, yeah, the same question was, and the people also very connected between all these uh, former states of Yugoslavia, a lot of uh, yeah, travel, uh, people lived in different places, people intermarried, people had a lot of uh, uh, personal and business contacts with everyone all over. And suddenly it all uh, started uh, being uh, assaulted with the various atrocities on various sides. And one of the uh, <laughs> Sarajevo uh, writers one day wrote something like this. And Dina, you reminded me of that. He said, this war is putting a barbed wire straight into my uh, bed between me and my wife. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, th that's that kind of like a knife in the, <laughs> in the heart sort of um, th that starts happening to some people. And is there a, um, a line or a limit where you can go over that or is it a gray zone or is it something sharp uh, that once something happens, you just cannot go back? So it's uh, so many questions for, for me and for everyone. Okay, go ahead, Eugene. Well, uh, by the way, if somebody wants to jump, feel free to do that. It's not... <clears throat> Well, in my view, <clears throat> uh, there is a, um, kind of uh, two big approaches to these kind of questions. Uh, one saying that uh, dialogue is always possible. You just need to find a way. And uh, I think it's coming from en enlightenment because it's a see dialogue is kind of rational discourse. So it's all this to find possible to find some good argument that uh, will you know, change people's mind. And then it's very important to be yourself open minded and ready to be changed and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the one, uh, sorry. And um, that's one kind of approach. Another things that it says that uh, kind of uh, dialogue is impossible completely and uh, 
uh, when the people have this, uh, by the way, even uh, it's also enlightenment approach to say the dialogue is impossible. Uh, it's in dialogue is impossible between rational and irrational people, or you can think immoral people. And so dialogue become completely impossible. <clears throat> And so this is also kind of enlightenment approach in my view, but uh, coming from, it's kind of continuation. Uh, among rational people, dialogue is always possible. Among irrational and rational people, dialogue is impossible until they become rational. You need to, uh, and for that, you need to have education. Education will make people rational. And then uh, among rational people, dialogue is always possible because they're rational. <clears throat> Well, uh, Bakhtin point of view, in my view, again, I'm projecting that because he never uh, directly talked about that, or at least I don't remember anything that he talked directly about these issues. But um, my kind of projection of his ontological dialogue, first of all, dialogue, it's not uh, about intellectual things for him. And he always write about that people engage in dialogue with their faith, with their reputations, with their uh, relationships <clears throat> with their well-being and that's why dialogue is so difficult because uh, it's not a, the changing position is not just intellectual it's not like just being open-minded or being rational or being uh, you uh, changing position uh, disrupts uh, relationship uh, let me provide interesting example of that uh, actually uh, related to Russia um, there was a very wonderful, interesting writer, uh, Andre Jit, and uh, he, um, a French writer. In the 30s, when in the, uh, I think in 35, uh, exactly, to be exact. So Hitler came to power in Germany. Soviet Union was considered to be a beacon at that time. People didn't know about Stalinist. A purchase, they didn't know about Gladomor, which is farming, uh, uh, kind of organized farming in Ukraine and so on and so forth. And especially people on the left uh, had a lot of hopes with Soviet Union. So he and Andre Sheet was a politically socialist and he decided to visit uh, Soviet Union in order to kind of uh, well, this, his agenda was to see how much Soviet Union can be a force against fascism uh, that's spreading in the Europe. So he went to uh, Soviet Union, spent time, and then wrote a, a very important book, which is shaking the whole thing. He's probably one of the first leftists who came completely different. He realized uh, he saw totalitarianism in Soviet Union. And he had a bravery to write a book about that. And he, when he write the book, he's, uh, in that book, he actually explained that I'm expecting of breaking many, many relationships. And <laughs> he was actually slightly underestimated what's happened. He became a pariah in uh, France and outside of France because people thought that he's betraying everything. And um, uh, many people turn back to him. And this is what how difficult dialogue is. And because in dialogue, and he was absolutely right in the sense to expect that. And it's happened actually much more than he expected. By the way, another person who experienced similar thing uh, was uh, George Orwell coming from Spain, experiencing terrible, uh, uh, terrible uh, atrocity of communist regime there. Uh, I don't know if you know that in the Spain, in the uh, kind of, uh, what's happened was it was a coup, communist coup there. That's why, by the way, Spain collapsed and there was purchase, people were killing there. And uh, it was similar to what's going on in Soviet Union at that time. It was organized by Soviet Union in part. So coming there, he was also a socialist and he changed his mind about, if you want, you can read his book, uh, that um, uh, homage to Catalan, where he described things and his own transformation. But by the way, as a result of that, many, many, many of his friends turned back on him. He completely changed, uh, he has to change environment. He, he lost his uh, connection, job connection, and so on and so forth. It was terrible, terrible things for him as well. 
So that the idea that dialogue is just about uh, ideas is, uh, Bakhtin pointed out, it's very wrong. It's not only about idea. He sometimes talk about personal idea in order to uh, emphasize the dialogue is not, you're talking to your whole, in dialogue you engage in the whole you with all your relationship and changing position sometimes means you have you breaking relationship with other people and you're jeopardizing your well-being like you're talking about Tara people resigning well it's part of that their well-being will be jeopardized and some people were fired actually some businesses are uh, like closed and people lose their uh, like livelihood as well and some people losing their freedom and some people will lose their whole life and this is part of, this is what the, why the dialogue is so tough. Uh, and um, so let me stop there because I can continue on and on, but I don't I want to, yeah. but let's <laughs> let me stop. The, uh, then the question is, uh, you know, with so much at stake, then, uh, I mean, like, and if you kind of then think that each person is kind of, uh, you know, has its own, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, restrictions and uh, I mean, like reservations and, uh, um, uh, you know, constraints. And then, uh, I mean, uh, where do we start a dialogue? How do we come out of that impasse? Well, I mean, like you, this person yeah. in UK, for example, uh, yeah, like you said, I understand he must have resigned because it was a question of his, uh, uh, you know, survival in his own university or wherever he is. If he didn't do it, then it is a job or whatever might be at stake. So where do you draw the line? Well, let, let me tell let me give personal example. My son is gay. When he came out, I have to cut off some relationship with some of my friends who is homophobic because I cannot continue. There is no dialogue possible. And uh, for me, I prioritize uh, well-being of my son uh, that we don't have in our house any homophobes. Mm -hmm. Because if I allow that to happen, I put in jeopardy of his well-being. And we, it's not, a, I, I'm talking not only I, it's my wife and I, we decided we, it was a very conscious decision that we are not allowed to have homophobes in our home anymore. And <clears throat> in terms of dialogue, uh, it means that with this homophobes, uh, dialogue is possible. It's just not between us and them. It's somebody else has to be engaged them who don't have children who are uh, gay children. And uh, somebody else will talk with them, no, but not us. Yeah. I think Tara, uh, uh, I think when you say where do you draw a line, there is no universal answer. That's a personal exactly. Answer. That's it. Yeah. A personal yeah. answer, and it could change from, from situation to situation, from place to place. Okay. There, if you start having many examples, it's just unbelievable. Uh, again, from the war in Yugoslavia. The day before Yugoslavia fell apart, the Yugoslavia army was one army and under command of, you know, like army structure is very hier hierarchical. Once it start, fell apart, there became different armies and people who were until yesterday buddies, officers that worked together came on different sides. So I just want to give one example from the book of Misha Glenny, who was a British journalist very uh, much involved in describing what's going on and he spoke our language. He describes one example where the commander of the Croatian forces is calling a commander of the some Serbian or Bosnian forces and says something like this. We have 10 bodies of your guys. What do you want us to do with them? Do you want us to transport them to you? Or do you want us to just put them in the ground here? And then it says, and by the way, my wife is sending regards to your wife. <laughs> yeah. You That's, know, it's yeah. just like unbelievable things happen when war started like that. So like, how can he talk like that? Where is his line? Uh, what is he doing to other people? It's just like mind blowing things. Exactly what happened during the India Indian partition, you know, 
people who are very close friends who are you know bound up with families they had to split and just be on the other side and then you know there was no dialogue after that everything stopped mm -hmm. so where do we <laughs> i know my point is how do we a kind of a make a, um, um, a kind of an in way through this impasse is what I'm, or is it just kind of you know something that we just have to put up with because this is happening i'm sure people all over the world okay uh, in my Lutara, i think uh, it's a wrong question uh, how to pass, get through the impasse because it implies that everyone can get through the impasse in my view no. impasse is also important mm. and acknowledging when you need to do impasse very important rather than to say to think where we can get through the impasse um, because it's again imply this idea that dialogue is always possible and it become back to this rationalist kind of thing no and, no no no, okay. I, no, 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 I understand that, but uh, yeah. I think this idea yeah. that dialogue is always possible is wrong. Mm. It is, in my view, it is possible kind of on um, uh, it's it possible between some people at some time, mm. but it's not possible any people at any time. Let me put that way. So. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is what important. Uh, and also important when um, kind of to engage. Like for example, um, I found uh, in United States that it's for me, it's much easier to engage with racist people who are against black people because I'm white. Mm -hmm. Then if, if I were white. So uh, I'm a Jew. So for me, it's very difficult to engage in dialogue with anti-Semite. And I think it's somebody else. It's not Jews' uh, uh, role to engage in dialogue with anti-Semites. Yeah. Uh, you see, so it's it's um, it depends you, and yeah. kind of uh, of who and when and under what circumstances uh, yeah. to do that. I think you need a third party. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, sometimes you need to have third party. And another thing, uh, like and even with third party, the question is like, where is that humanity uh, can be uh, kind of restored? But usually it's, uh, fine. it's very difficult to talk, engage in dialogue with the person who denied your existence, mm -hmm. who see you as an object and usually bad object, not just any object, but even bad object. Yeah. By the same token that you say that dialogue is not always possible, the same way uh, becoming more humanitarian in the way we understand is also a question mark, big question mark. Can people really turn humanitarian? Uh, the thing is uh, that uh, humanity is almost like, in my view, a part of that. It's almost like uh, the metaphor of this, when you know uh, the uh, interesting uh, uh, Scanion gets through the asphalt. You can see that, and it's very, it looks like it's very weak. And you always think how come it could get from the asphalt? Asphalt is, or even concrete, it huh. could be very strong. And nevertheless, it can get through that. So it's very interesting. Um, one interesting example of this kind of strange possibilities. Uh, I don't know if you, um, uh, uh, watch this documentary that's called a blind spot it's about uh, it's a, based on the real uh, situation it's about secretary or hitler's secretary uh, young uh, at that time uh, she was very 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 young woman who became a secretary of hitler and who uh, had a very interesting relationship with the hitler in a sense because it was uh, she, he was for her as a father figure. He uh, cared about her. He protected her from sexual harassment of the, his officers. By the way, he punished them absolutely um, severely for, uh, for uh, harassment. And in many, many, we need to do something about the translation. Yeah, or... but I don't know who will translate because we don't have 
a translator, ah. Catherine, okay. uh, was supposed to be here. She's and she's oh, not okay. yet there. Um, Artem, здравствуйте. Вы не знаете, uh, uh, Катя придет или нет? Хороший вопрос, не знаю. Спасибо. Yeah. So we don't know how to do. <laughs> we have now a person who cannot speak, uh, who, uh, he cannot speak English, speaks Russian. So we probably can, I don't know how to do that, to do this yeah. collective translation. Yeah, Eugene and everyone, um, I just need to be excused for a little while. I'll come back and join you in another 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I'll come back and join you, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. But at, at the same time, the secretary was uh, typed terrible orders, like about uh, Holocaust and many other things without noticing how terrible they are. And she had this relationship with the Hitler as a very, very humane, and very warm and so on and so forth. And this is a uh, interesting situation. On one uh, thinks it's very hopeful that humanity was still there, but it was very fragmented. <laughs> it was for some people, but not for other people. But it gives kind of uh, some kind of hope that uh, humanity is always there. It's possible one way or another connect but also it is kind of bad news that it can be very fragmented. So for Hitler, human, uh, human relationship and dialogue only possible for his people. But outside of his people, uh, there was no dialogue. So the question, that's why it's interesting idea how to can be mediated through this, <laughs> through somehow that, uh, from the other way. I think that uh, several but, things are at stake, sorry. Uh, uh, one thing is like, where do you put this boundary? Who are your people and who are not? And uh, various degrees of nationalism there, like kind of like uh, identity, identity, like who are you and who you think you belong to or not. And another thing that's at stake is what is truth, of course. And the third one is, uh, of, of, of what values are you actually pushing with uh, and how they clash with other people's values but this who is the, your people is very much manipulated always of course in in, in th these difficult situations by saying russians or serbs or whatever nationalities they become lumped together as if this is one force which we all know that it's not true that there is so much, so many different people. And, but still there is some kind of feeling that so, there is some kind of belonging and you say, I'm a Jew. And if somebody is going uh, anti-Semitism, I cannot talk about it, but I can talk about other kinds of nationalistic or racist uh, and, and, and be in dialogue about that and try to kind of mediate it. So it's, it's like interesting how that happens. Mm -hmm. Dinner? Um, yeah, well, um, it's difficult to get mediators among normal, simple, just everyday people when you are just, when you suddenly find yourself at odds with all your friends and you feel like my sister says that she feels like as if she is fanatical now, as if she has to prove stuff. As, she, as if she has to prove things that were normal yesterday, like the sun is shining. And she feels now that now she has to prove that it is shining and that she absolutely has to do it. Mm -hmm. So, and you can't find mediators there. Everybody is stressed and in pain. And is it just it? You find new friends and you move on I, I mean if it's not a bloody conflict I'm talking about just uh, mm -hmm. this side of things and is there my thought process as well is is it possible because all these examples show that you accept it you move on you you don't you find people who can help you talk third parties, but is there a way 
to move into the future to talk more freely to to do it better like what are we creating for kind of next mm -hmm. well one thing that and this is especially important in education as well but not only education again one of the Mm, in my view, strength of the Bakhtinian position about an ontological dialogue in a way that um, uh, being is important and relationships are important in a way um, they also guide us. Let me provide examples. I'm, I'm just teaching a class right now. Actually, it's a graduate class. It's for aspiranti, if it's uh, uh, in uh, Russian, because the problem is terminology is so different in uh, different countries. In uh, UK, it's called postgraduate, and United States is called graduate. Um, so anyway, it's and then I have a lot of um, students there who have a very traditional view of education. So uh, uh, traditional and progressive, it's kind of between traditional and progressive, but they really like this idea of educational standards. Uh, and this continued discussion of that going on. Uh, and some students uh, kind of question that, and but not strongly. But one interesting thing is that since the class, uh, our class itself, the way um, how it's going to be, what's the relationship, what's whatever, that in our class there is no standards and so on and so forth. In a way, part of this discussion is constantly returning back to our class, what, how you feel in the class. In a way, experiencing our class by the students constantly disrupts their ideas about uh, uh, about what they think about what the good education should be. Uh, so it's not through the just arguments, but through experiences of what's going on here and now. So in a way, the relationship uh, among people can be also a very strong guiding force. And that's... Um, important to think about that, that the uh, experiences are also guide people besides arguments. By the way, they guide in very strange way because <laughs> people might say, I like that, but for other people it should be different. <laughs> but still it creates this uh, important, almost like, um, how to say that? It's, it's almost like uh, become dissonance, creating a dissonance, which is not a small thing. I'm not even sure arguments guide anyone. No, they do. I think, I th I think there is a, uh, they do, and, but not fully, I, I think. They do. Because there is, there is some emotional block yeah. that just stops any arguments going through on either side. And there is this, there we go. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's interesting, I think, because, um, you know, it, going back to the uh, your African subcontinent, w when there was the war between the, um, uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis, the, the language that was used was one of alienation, you know, this was this notion of uh, one group calling, uh, regarding the other group as akin to crickets, you know, so it was a metaphor, but one that um, conveyed um, a lack of humanity on on the other group. And so they were, you know, one could have metaphors about squashing crickets, for example. So there's quite a good um, philosophical discussion about this in, I don't recall the, the paper, but it's at um, either postgraduate or graduate level, uh, Eugene. <laughs> 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 no, no, it doesn't, a level, it doesn't matter. It's just like... I know, I know. The word. The word. It, <laughs> it too, in elementary school, in kindergarten, it's everywhere. It doesn't matter. Level, nothing to do with that. It's more classification and evaluative. You know. yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, I think, to look at, um, at the example that this paper looked at, which was to see how the language used you know, was able to alienate and to other 
a, a group, you know, and I think, um, I think you're possibly right, Dina. You know, I mean, I don't know about no logic, no discussion doing any good at all. Um, because um, it's, it's hard, it's hard, you know, Wittgenstein had this distinction between what you can say and what you can show. And I'm just, you know, you might want to think, well, if you can show something, then that might have more influence than saying it. But saying is a sort of showing as well. You know, so possibly you have the same problem, no matter how we do it, you know, because there is great difference, isn't there? Um, when these things come to, come up, you know, and, and my study is going to be on Fiji, because there there's great difference between the um, native Fijians, the uh, Itokai, and and the um, diasporic Indian group that came um, as indentured laborers. But I mean, the second group have been in Fiji since gee, 1850 or something. And so they regard themselves um, as, um, as Pacific Island people, you know, which is fair enough. They were born there, they lived there, they mm. sometimes died there, you know, and so on. So, so there's a great deal of, um, a polarization in, in that in that country, and every time uh, Indians seem to be in the you know, Indo um, uh, Indo Fijians appear to be in the um, rising position. The um, the other group bring in the uh, army and the police to to have a coup. So a coup is always possible if you have the power. A bit like Russia today. One interesting situation, uh, uh, kind of uh, especially tough, when the whole fight, as Anna was saying, uh, uh, going through the family and mm. um, uh, how to deal with that. And I don't know, Dina, if you experienced that or somebody or Anna or Olga or Artyom. Uh, so uh, it's very a lot of my friends have. Even mm -hmm. without this war, I experienced this in the last two or three years with my brother who uh, lives in Israel, but became suddenly a follower of Trump here and believer mm -hmm. in QAnon and the anti-vaxxer and all of that. It just became impossible to talk with any arguments with him. And for a long time, we just avoided these topics. So it's kind of like there is no dialogue of this. So it's kind of like partial. We cannot uh, talk about this. So then just talk about weather and uh, grandchildren and uh, not dangerous topic until it at one point broke last year. And uh, it just, at this moment, I'm in this dilemma, should I call him or not? Or it's a year we are not talking at all because of it became stronger. And it's very tough. Yeah, it's kind of creating taboo topics mm -hmm. and uh, the have relationship the around of this taboo topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. also very difficult to avoid when the taboo topic is the topic that everybody is thinking about. And yeah. yeah. But uh, you know what, what's interesting is uh, that right now, uh, let me provide the interesting political situation in the United States because um, majority of uh, so-called Russian immigrants were, especially in my generation and older, were supporting Trump. But now the same people are uh, against uh, like Putin, this regime, and so which is Trump's supports. So the, it's a very interesting situation where actually some bridges are built right now. Mm. Because in a way, it's interesting how war for sometimes separates people, but sometimes it unites people who were separated. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very bizarre kind of this situation uh, going on right now. It is just mind blowing how many people supported it within Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not uh, the part of that that's not surprising because Tony was talking about that because the state actually create uh, uh, propaganda and assault on the on the institutions of truth, 
which is uh, part of that. Uh, and uh, you know, Gary Kasparov, and for people who don't know who he is, he was a chess champion. And at some point he was run as a president of Russia. And now he's in the United States. He uh, wrote in, uh, I think, eight years ago that part of this propaganda, and this is new approach to the propaganda, he said, uh, like traditional propaganda is uh, suppressing alternative points of view and only establishing uh, the one monologic uh, kind of truth uh, in the society, which uh, usually based on the so-called fake news and so on and so forth. But he said the new type of propaganda is very different. It's uh, so what he calls the goal of that propaganda to exhaust critical thinking. And it's doing like that. How do you know it's true? Uh, and since it's impossible to check everything, uh, you know, it's almost like creating that swamp in those people in the alternative opinions. There is opinion about this, opinion that, that, that. everything is allowed, but in a way you're swamping because there is no, um, you cannot kind of <laughs> develop any fact because a about anything, there is hundreds of other opinions, alternative opinions. And how do you know that? each of them truth. Also, uh, it's a uh, part of that propaganda to say that everybody lie and make examples of that specific mm -hmm. situations. And sometimes it's true, media even that committed to the truth, sometimes uh, they make mistakes and sometimes in them there is lying going on there. Although that media is trying, which is good media, professional, honest media, they try to correct mistakes try to reveal the liars and the lies. And that's how it's different that. But the propaganda constantly pointing on these mistakes, errors, and lies, and say, you cannot trust anything. In this case, whole truth is collapsing for people. And when they're collapsing, that official monologic discourse penetrates people because nothing else is available, basically, because it's the strongest voice. And that's what the tragedy part of that, uh, that actually Tony was talking about of use of the discourse. The discourse become a weapon in a way, the way how to phrase people. If you call immigrants, for example, cockroaches or people whom you don't like or, or women, like uh, Jews are women in Germany, it creates, you know, listening to these words, it works on the almost subconscious because we don't like cockroaches, we don't like uh, vermin, we don't this, we don't like that, we don't like rats, but all this language, we don't like Nazi, but all this language penetrates. Mm -hmm. We've had a, a raised hand, but mm -hmm. I don't know who this person is, so. Uh, it uh, could be, oh, is uh, it or okay, or, or, or... Yeah. Hello. Olga. It's Hi. Olga. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm completely new. I just saw your um, ad and I thought I would join because it's something that bothers me at the moment. So uh, I'm Olga. I'm from UK. I'm originally from uh, a Russia, St. Petersburg, but my dad is Ukra a Ukrainian. My mom is a Russian. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, uh, I think, uh, the conversation is possible if you decide what you're talking about. Are you talking about geopolitics? Are you talking from a humanitarian point of view? And that's for any subject. You need to find the field you, to, because you can't throw uh, all various arguments because it, it just confuses everyone. If you're talking from geopolitical point of view, you can use one type of arguments. If you're talking from a humanitarian point of view, you're talking about different arguments. Then this is the way of finding some, I don't know, dialogue with people who are there. And um, uh, what I found surprising is every information I share with um, you know, people that I know, uh, what they do, uh, they fact check it against their own internet. And they, of course, they come back with different results. So what we all do, we fact check, but we fact check here and they fact check there. And if it happens so many times, 
you know, you tell them one thing, they fact check, it turned out lie, then you have another thing. And what happens that in their, you know, in their world, um, everything you come up is like tragic and drama and for them, everything is fine. And then they don't take any information from you as real. So they have, the same happens otherwise. As if, for example, there are lots of sources and uh, as you rightly say that suppressing alternative uh, point of view is the way of uh, how propaganda works, but it works here as well. There is no alternative view. There is no even possibility to discuss it without being crucified. So I think uh, we don't have anywhere free speech at all. Um, for example, Russian speaking, People don't understand the difference between Russian speaking and Russian. Uh, and when I try to explain, for example, that not all English speaking people are American. So it's, it's just like completely, and also not all English speaking are Trump supporters. So, and people just don't understand it. And in UK, we have uh, like right now, I'm encountering with, uh, numerous cases of uh, like russophobia simply because people are uneducated on the matter. Uh, the generalization, I think it's the major issue that, uh, and also I think we all tired of COVID and we all just, you know, we have so much disappointment and probably bitterness in us. Mm -hmm. Many people used it as a reason to, I don't know, get rid of the anger. And sometimes just when you start conversation from one point, you end up having a row about com something completely different. So uh, for me, I think the major issue that I have is a lack of education and unbiased education. I, I can be wrong, but that's just what I believe. Mm -hmm. Let me tell an interesting story about how uh, like so something like that could happen even in a classroom. Uh, <clears throat> I was teaching in California. I just started teaching in the United States and I was teaching this, this was uh, just beginning of my class. It was, uh, so I had a very interesting um, class on, uh, um, it involved education students, undergraduate students, and psychology, and some other areas. And I had one student who was, which is, I didn't know that such thing exists before, uh, <laughs> before that incident. Uh, he, he was a Native American, and he was a racist Native American. So what his was idea was that uh, all Americas should be clean from white people, and they should be killed, better to kill. And if not, they should escape and move away. For some strange reason, uh, he, in the class, which was very diverse in many ways, he had two people whom uh, he kind of respected. And uh, one of them was me, which is I couldn't understand why, because I'm white, so I'm supposed to be that enemy that should be eliminated. Uh, but another one was my TA who was uh, mine, so he was Native American as well, so it was more uh, understandable. By the way, he belongs to the Aztec uh, tribe. And so, by the way, uh, we, we had this discussion in class, I had discussion with him and so on. So. Uh, but one incident was really, really put me to the kind of, to the crisis, I would say that way. I had, which at that time I thought, rather old student, which is, I don't think I will <laughs> say it now. She was almost like 50 years old. And for me, she looks like very, very, very old. And <laughs> so she had a daughter. And, and what about and, now? Yeah, yeah now right now she's so young, I would say. <laughs> 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 but but uh, she had a daughter, she talked about her daughter who almost, uh, she committed suicide, but fortunately survived. And it was something we were discussed in the class and she brought this example of something. And he make a, a comment like that. It's too bad that she survived. It would have been one white person less. And that I thought that was it. 
And I thought that he should be kind of expelled from the class because it's impossible to continue like that. Because uh, by the way, that woman started crying uh, and uh, I told him to leave the class uh, just for that time. And, uh, and by the way, he followed that because for some reason he super respected me. I don't know why. And I thought that he should not come back. But what was interesting um, that his classmates actually petitioned to me to keep him in class, including that woman. And they said, it's very difficult to uh, keep him in the class, but it's kind of very important to think what he's saying and to think about his grievances and so on and so forth. So um, it's important to keep that. So I, well, I thought that their opinion of you is of course most important, especially that woman. Uh, so he continued to be in the class, but I'm just telling it was very difficult uh, whole situation by the whole class, but to the end it was because of him, it was very, very difficult to have, but they thought that it's important to keep tie with him and uh, to keep him in. But part of that it's because uh, there was a huge support for each other in the class of this of, of the students. So that was an interesting experience for me was there. That's a very interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> well, by the way, one interesting thing was just historical uh, that Aztecs and Aztec Empire was heavily uh, persecuted minds and minds were slaves in that empire. So the discussion that my uh, uh, teaching assistant had, my teaching with, with, uh, uh, with this Aztec uh, student was very, also very interesting. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, but, but nevertheless, uh, we managed to uh, survive, although again, it was, terrible emotional toll on everybody, uh, including on me, because I was constantly feeling that maybe I'm doing wrong thing, uh, maybe I should expel him. But uh, again, because of my students' uh, insistence that I should keep him, I like follow them. Although again, it was ter very, difficult, very difficult. What, what would you have done, Eugene, if, if the woman who had been upset wanted him gone? Absolutely expelled him. I had no any uh, doubts about that. By the way, even everybody would say she should stay. And she said, he should be expelled, I would expel him. Just one person would say that and I will, he will be out. Just because they're unanimously uh, wanted to keep him. That's... Um... So yes, if, if you start, if somebody for you crosses the line of some kind of moral, uh, human uh, dignity plus uh, really endangers other people as you see that's that's your personal line yeah, yeah. by the way that's my and rule. then it's a great example of having a third party for everyone yeah because yeah. everybody was supporting each other so they had this kind of uh, system where they wouldn't be too hurt yeah. Well, so they were I, fine I, being shaken. Uh, that's why even, you know, politically, you're trying to find out a third party to negotiate between parties in a war because you have to have somebody who is uh, who can be not so invested and who cannot fall apart with with the same conflict, but can talk both ways. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem anybody's doing it right now. But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I just want to tell you that is my uh, personal policy about uh, on Facebook. I'm not banning anyone with uh, like people uh, have very different uh, views unless they start crossing the line on either personal attacks or make uh, statements, ab absolutely hateful statements and then against uh, other people and this way uh, so far, by the way, I, I, I managed not to ban uh, anyone. There was one time that I was that close to do that. And I talked to that person and that person stopped doing that. And I, I just told them that if you want to continue, uh, this is, should be the rule that you should not cross. 
You can say whatever you say, outrageous things, it's fine, but not to cross that line. And he didn't after that, but again, at that time. But it's a very hard position. At the beginning of the wars in Yugoslavia, it was the beginning of the 90s, and I don't know how much people remember or even know, it was also the beginning of the internet in many ways. And so at that time, there was a lot of a, uh, 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 internet connection between people from various uh, parts of Yugoslavia on something which was called Usenet almost it was the first kind of social media but it was all uh, through the email or like you have to get there like on a billboard uh, no pictures or anything and so people were writing very uh, uh, flaming uh, articles almost at each other from different points of view and at that time I was really thinking I can kind of like bring them all together and trying to to talk in that kind of like, a, uh, uh, let's give it a benefit of the doubt. Maybe this person just has wrong information or they're not educated enough. Or maybe, you know, if we can just establish uh, some kind of like a solid ground for all of us from which we can then talk, uh, even disagree, but not kind of like insult each other. And then from different parts of uh, people were trying to figure out who am I? Am I a Serb? Am I a Croat? Am I a Bosnian? Because, be, uh, because it was always like, what is behind your words? So everybody was angry with me that I'm a traitor here and I'm traitor there <laughs> because I was not agreeing for, to these animosities, trying to always I'm to talk to people who were disagreeable to the others, still argue that we can have a talk, but at some point it all fell apart, really. Even on the internet. But I would say there are some uh, very important successes uh, that I experienced, just experiencing now, mm -hmm. and in both kind of cases, uh, one or another, but I'm always uh, treat them as miracles and not something to take for granted mm -hmm. I, uh, and uh, and when it's happened it's great but mostly it's happened exactly because uh, <laughs> I, i'm always thinking about myself as in many ways not always as a boundary person because uh, I'm neither there nor here <laughs> for many different reasons. And uh, that could be helpful because uh, it's uh, exactly can, I can mediate in that sense. I can bring voices of other people who are denied for some, one reason or another by some other people to have voice. And uh, and that can be helpful to bring this voice of other people. But again, to access, it's not, my feeling is that many ways it's not uh, appealing to facts, although, because exactly the, usually uh, the whole thing is going to be undermining facts and what fact for another, one person is not another. And Olga, one important things that I want to tell you that, uh, you see, we need to talk, uh, we need to focus on one topic. The problem is almost impossible <coughs> because what's one considered to be topic, the other denied that it's a topic uh, and vice versa. Uh, like, <laughs> let me give example, like recent example, suddenly uh, like a, a, my former classmate uh, uh, wanted to, to, to discuss a war of 1812 in uh, between British and uh, Americans. And, you know, it's kind of interesting things to discuss this maybe in other time. But like, uh, you know, <laughs> I feel it's very, very remote one thing. And my, again, emotional and whole things is not about discussing this historical things about what's happened in 1812 in United States between English and uh, between British and, and Americans, <laughs> but honestly, I'm just thinking how to help people, uh, my friends, Ukrainian friends in Europe, or how to leave them country, or how to help send, send uh, medicine in Russia, or transfer money, or, you know, this is where my mind is, but not to discuss war of 
1812, <laughs> like atrocity of this war. Uh, <laughs> although in another time, I think it's a terrific topic, why not to do that? And I would like to educate myself because many things I don't know about the war 1812 uh, in uh, but, You know, in people United start States. like almost like little children, like who started first? Where is the root? of all the conflict and they start finding things like, oh, they did this to them, they did this to them, or you can, you can equate this to this. And of course, talking about this uh, whole past and redefining what's the truth, like from the 1812 or maybe from the 60, uh, fr from the 1500 something, because in Yugoslavia, it was redefining Ottoman Empire at that time. Uh, the, the, the skeletons were raised from uh, who is a Turk or Muslim and who wasn't. And, uh, and it was just like almost like in a Freudian, uh, uh, what Freud said about a uh, uh, person that the sense of time collapses completely in some kind of derangements. And what was yesterday has become so relevant today uh, for some people in some situations. So it is, I think, about what's uh, that, that thing about discussing what's true, like trying to, as you said, Dina, to prove that sunshine is sunshine, but my sunshine and your sunshine maybe have different colors, you know, I don't know. Uh, but we have to, 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 to kind of like establish what's the truth for some people. And well, for the other people, it's not important what was in the past. We are now here in this situation. Like, let's see what good can we make in this situation. Forget the past, maybe, you know, maybe it's true, it doesn't true, it doesn't matter really. Let's make, be human right now, so. Yeah, but, but, but the problem is what's topic is, is different for different yeah. people. Mm -hmm. An interesting case to me was um, I, I went to see my, my doctor, who's um, um, an Indian woman uh, in, in New Zealand, and, uh, and I was talking about this thesis I'm doing on, um, on the conflict between the Indo Fijians and the um, Itoke people. And she managed to come up with um, uh, that 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 her parents were, um, and and her I gathered as well, completely anti-nationalist as regards um, as regards the British Raj. You know, she she wanted um, things to stay as they were, or her parents did at least. Um, I surmise from this that they were doing okay under the system, of course. Um, but I think the the, the message to me was in a sense that these things don't get lost, you know. Um, one could imagine in, in those days, it would be difficult to express too strong uh, a nationalist opinion as an in Indian woman. Um, and that, um, um, you know, these things have a kind of a, they get up a, a head of steam, you know, like a like a big train rushing on and they, they take people with them and and alternative voices do certainly get lost, you know. Um, and and I think, as uh, Anna, you were saying, in respect of the um, Internet of Things, um, the stuff now is, um, uh, you know, we have these uh, echo chambers and epistemic bubbles and so on and so forth. Um, and as a result, you know, you can easily be in one camp or the other. And and the, the groups are going to talk past each other, for sure. And it's a question then, from you know, as Dina says, well, well, how do we do anything about this? How do we, how does dialogue help in this case? And so I think there's a serious sort of problem that, I mean, obviously it existed before. Voices were silenced. You know, um, Franz Fanon wrote. You know. Um, but we need this violence, you know. <laughs> we need this violence because there's almost um, there's almost no chance that a colonial oppressor will take the boot off the neck. You know, <laughs> I mean, why would they? What's how does it benefit them except for um, you know, some humanitarian considerations? How how does how do people decide that they're going to be nice? You know. Whereas before it, it benefits them to be not nice, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, 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 that's the problem is to actually <laughs> make this decision. It's not about how, but when and why and many other things. Mm. Uh, when to draw a line and say goodbye or get, when to draw a line and say taboo. Uh, when to draw a line and to become almost like, especially in some places that you have to do it, uh, you become get in the closet and uh, or in uh, Russia term is internal immigration <laughs> because you cannot immigrate at all uh, when you cannot immigrate physically you have to immigrate internally and to create safe space for yourself and for your family for your friends and uh, and where to keep uh, connections uh, like in your family and uh, or with other people and focus on kind of human uh, caring and uh, about some kind of keep breaches on other topics on something that it's not uh, this explosive and when to take a fight actually, and in this case, it kind of fight dialogue rather than uh, something else dialogue, by the way, that's also a dialogue. And when uh, you exactly, it's uh, try to actually connect the person to listen carefully, try to reply to their concerns, try to build uh, connections uh, through that and have some kind of dialogue and find, as Olga said, co try to find common topic within this uh, conflict uh, that interesting for both people uh, uh, or different parties. I, I, I think this is what diversity of the whole thing is very important to keep in mind rather than to think how uh, or, or this or that, uh, because I think all of this diversity possible and necessary to consider and legitimate. But and sometimes it, to be a fighter, that's part of this as well. But also this uh, this uh, kind of like, where do you uh, put not a line, but that corridor of a uh, common interest? For instance, Doctors Without Borders, they, they have a very defined task and they defined values that they will help people to survive physically and heal them, no matter who they are, they're just about their bodies. And so th for them, it's a very clear what they are about, what they are doing. And nothing else matters, whether you are from this side, that side, you think this, it, it doesn't matter, but it's still something that can unite them all to work on that common area. Other areas, are, very complex, of course, much more complex because it's not about bodies, but, but about people's minds and relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and there you have to establish your own bridges where you can or, or can. Mm -hmm. If you can find a kind of like, I think uh, it's not only dialogue, but uh, uh, what what sometimes can help it can if you can have a common action on something like agree to do something even on, on a very small scale with all the disagreements but uh, establish one thing that should be achieved mm -hmm. together and uh, which is a uniting thing you know so so you constantly between the forces that kind of really push your way and trying to find forces that could bring you together um because we, we always live in a regular times in, in some kind of, I wouldn't want to say balance, but we do uh, uh, kind of like dance around these forces pushing and, and, and coming to, and that was also Bakhtinian, the centrifugal and centripetal forces. But in, in not such perilous times, they could be, well, for, for personally, it could be perilous, but it's not on a large scale. What's difficult, difficult is when, in, in times of such crisis that it's on a large scale where a lot of things are not in your control and not your decision whatsoever. I'm reminded of um, just the term polarization is, is interesting and from physics, uh, as Eugene will possibly remember, um, uh, there's a term depolarization as well. And I think, um, the notion of depolarization action uh, that you've 
refer to in, in my view, Anna, is, is, is possibly one that, that makes sense because, you know, uh, I mean, allowing free speech ever since the Enlightenment is, is, um, is very important as, a, as, a, um, as something to aspire to. But um, uh, of course, in the days where, where one can become, as, as they say, um, not without some reservation, the notion of, of tribalism um, can dominate, then it's important to, to, to de-tribalize, to depolarize, to somehow get people back together as opposed to being separated. So if separation is the problem, then um, the, the, the inverse of that um, is, is what needs to be done. Um, and I mean, in terms of argument, of course, then, then rhetoric was the old way of, of doing this, the art of persuasion. Um, but now, well, it's not going to work in a, in, a, in a situation where you've got um, these uh, echo chambers and epistemic bubbles and things. It's um, the structures, the external structures that hold this thing in place are, are close to impenetrable. In continuation, Tony, what you're talking about, uh, I was thinking recently, uh, by the way, I was recently thinking about edu in education, but suddenly it became because of the war outside of education as well. It's kind of interesting idea of uh, ideal, like to what to try to, uh, what to try to achieve or to what end trying to move. And mm -hmm. usually for some one dominant, I will say grand narrative in a way, is to try to move to the idea of uh, where community, where the family, where this and that, a very neat group, the idea is like as a humanity. I'm talking about this mm -hmm. ideal for humanity is to make it a uh, uh, kind of cohesion, to create this cohesion in the values, in the agreements, in the concerns and so so forth. And I'm more and more recently become uh, uh, convinced it's a very wrong ideal. And because the ideal is, it's a something that uh, uh, actually it's almost on the surface where uh, 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 in the even our terminology when we using, like for example, civilization or politeness or uh, to be uh, civil, or, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what does it mean? Well, civilization, it's coming from the word city. It's, or police also, all, all of these words, polite, coming from, it's another language. City is coming from uh, one language and uh, politeness, uh, police and all of these words coming from another language. But means the same thing, city. And what uh, constitutes city? Uh, this in, in contrast to let's say village, um, like you know what talking about people, we're a global village. I think it's a wrong, wrong metaphor. We should be a global city, not a global village. And the reason is because the city is uh, it's uh, it's a kind of uh, sociality, or I don't know how to call it, of strangers. There are strange uh, communities, strange people strangers who live to choose to live in peace with each other. So they're not having common values. They don't have a, a common agreement about many things. What they have agreement is they want to live in peace with each other. And I think this is, I think it's a good uh, ideal for, I think uh, this is what I think right now. It's a good ideal for humanity to think about we're not global village, we're global city. Where people, uh, it, where people uh, say, live and let live other who are different than you are. And constantly emphasizing the sameness, it's I think it's a mistake that leads to the more polarization. Because uh, of course the question becomes, who is community is the community. Who is values is the values. And uh, there is a constant idea of monopoly on that. 
if we think about that where community and where village and something like that. And I think it's very important to kind of say, well, I don't understand that what you're saying and I don't, uh, I don't agree with your values and that's okay, except when there is a peace there. When there is no peace, that's the biggest problem. We don't need to agree. We don't need to agree about facts. We don't need to agree about, except one thing. We need to agree in a way we need to accept each other uh, existence, which can be very painful. And that's tough. By the way, that's the whole idea of the freedom of speech. It's based on this idea. It's not freedom of speech for people, for agreement, for good speech. It's a, it's a freedom for bad speech but uh, still insisting on peace. And the, the boundary of the freedom of speech, for example, it's exactly breaking peace in, and I'm talking about peace, not kind of uh, emotional peace. Emotional is fine, but breaking the peace of like physical, when the war style, when people start killing each other, that's, what it's about. And that's what my kind of recent thinking about that. And again, I was thinking about an education, <laughs> but now it's kind of coming to the um, other areas as well. And I think we should be careful even in dialogue because the uh, in dialogue, the whole idea is exactly to restore humanity and interest in each other in that type of the peaceful uh, coexistence of strangers rather than trying to bring them in my own community and make them my people. And by the way, that also means that somebody in the, what you previously thought in your community can become a stranger, which is fine. Or it could be stranger in one sense and part of the community in another. That's also, well, there is so many different possibilities that are possible in the city, in the metaphor of the city rather than metaphor of the village. Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, also a matter of uh, uh, of the times because uh, it's a very when you have a long slack, as they say, when you have a lot of resources uh, and it doesn't, you don't feel threatened. You feel like okay, people can think this, I can think this, or I can part with that person or not. But in these difficult times, is people start losing these resources because you you just cannot uh, you feel like you're on an attack your own personal your ontology is on an attack even with the word or even with the, how you pronounce the word Kharkov or Kharkiv or whatever everything becomes a matter of a uh, defining this uh, yeah, whether you whether you're gonna kill me or I'll kill you or, or we, we cannot it's a, like a dance macabre uh, it, it does take two parties nobody can now say okay just stop like stop with this one like stop that, be, you know, like how you stop these things. That's the, uh, you can be the most peaceful person You and, and to find some ways to just kind of like de-escalate that. Yeah, it just seems that uh, when you're describing this thing where uh, we're not trying to make people the same, but you still are putting boundaries so many people who it seems want aggression. And I I don't know how to do that in reality because it seems that to so many people, it's just fine. Like war is apparently fine. Aggression is fine. And it's just oh, such a huge gap. It is tough, uh, Dina, I agree with you, but also it's, the problem is nothing is symmetrical and that's uh, the problem is as well. And uh, it's almost like uh, in a book of the, in the Bible, in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is time for this or time for that. And, uh, and that, that's also difficult. Like it's very difficult for people, let's say in Ukraine to say, well, let's stop aggression and I was, I'll personally start with the stopping aggression. Well, you know, when the bombs are uh, going uh, like, like throwing on you or your family or people whom you dare, it's very difficult to say, well, let's stop the aggression on my side and, uh, or unilaterally or because somebody should stop it. 
Um, difficult, difficult, difficult. It's that's <laughs> life of versus. I mean, what is what I find very, very hopeful is I know one person who is Ukrainian and did not become aggressive. <laughs> that brings a lot of uh, hope to me. <laughs> well, I have a lot of people in Ukraine who is not aggressive in the sense of uh, uh, the not demonizing uh, the others. But on the other hand, uh, many, well, actually all of them would support uh, the Ukrainian troops as much as possible. And uh, so it's a very uh, different things. And uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is where uh, kind of things are tough. Mm -hmm. And very contradictory, and and uh, and part of that, it's uh, in my view, it's part of the humanity to be, to be human, to be contradictory, <laughs> to speak out of mind, out of heart, and uh, and they contradict each other, and uh, to speak out of necessities, and to speak of this and that, and it's very difficult to make this what to prioritize in the given moment. I'm home finally. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was thinking a lot. I was uh, listening very carefully to everyone. And uh, I would just uh, would like to share some of my feelings because it's kind of uh, going on around me, all the talks, all the chats that I'm subscribed to. Uh, in social networks and uh, uh, well it feels like there is a lot of fear and uh, probably fear doesn't uh, doesn't help to build a dialogue yeah and uh, so I heard uh, um, an interpretation that uh, so people like parents elderly people especially yeah, if they take uh, like pro Putin position, yeah, they may do it out of fear, not just because they have been brainwashed with propaganda, but uh, because they are afraid for themselves, they're afraid for their children, and they want the best for their children. Yeah, and uh, so they kind of have to join their attacking side. Uh, yeah, and uh, in order not to be hurt themselves, which of course would not help as we know from the Soviet past. So if you're quiet, you can still be uh, punished. <laughs> you can still be a victim of uh, the regime. And, uh, uh, well, what else? Yeah, I've been also thinking a lot these days about the third alternative, like uh, how, can it, how can it be, like what can it be? Uh, yes, yeah, somebody, some mediating side, or just uh, some kind of field which can uh, invite all the people who can build, uh, who is willing to build the future, yeah, and who are thinking about how to prevent uh, anything like that, or just uh, who want to live their lives. I don't know. And uh, yeah, well, well, what else I would like to say that. Of course, people uh, who are fighting now, I mean, in the families, not, not in the actual war zone, yeah. Uh, so people who are um, standing for their positions uh, very strongly, uh, I think that for some people that may be a chance just to speak out. So that is probably some conflict that has been there for some time already, uh, like between the kids and the parents or between uh, the spouses, and they just, uh, mm, this situation sparkled uh, something in them, they encouraged them to speak up, and they used this situation to decide some of their older conflicts. Yeah, and uh, of course there is a lot of emotion, and probably it's not possible to start building a dialogue before all the emotion has, uh, uh, how do you call it, yeah, is uh, uh, like thrown out. 
uh, at each other. Yeah, and only after this uh, wave, emotional wave passes, it is possible to uh, speak. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One thing that uh, I'm just reminded me, uh, Anna, what you're talking about, which is very interesting, about um, there was Gregory Bat Batson, uh, Batson? Bateson. 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 I, I know that something is wrong that I pronounce his name. He was, uh, it's difficult to pinpoint who he was. Uh, if you know uh, who was Margaret Mead, uh, she was anthropologist and he was, at some point he was uh, her husband, uh, one of <laughs> several. Uh, and uh, he was kind of philosopher. He was uh, actually thinking about cybernetics, which is at that time didn't exist in the 30s. And so he's many, 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 many things. But he was also anthropologist. Uh, and one thing that he discovered, uh, he kind of discovered almost like psychology of the conflict he observed. And he said that in conflicts, uh, and I forgot he has a term, schizo, it's like the idea is the following. If let's say, uh, like Anna, you and I, we have some disagreement about something we will start increasing this disagreement more and more and more until we get almost unbearable positions, which is actually do not reflect where we are. But more and more, it become almost like a mask that we put on our faces because we like increasing in the small things, it become huge things. And uh, so he observed that in many, many different cultures, by the way, that's what kind of interesting things about that, uh, this uh, kind of interesting phenomena, psychological phenomena, or, so, and he said, it's not only psychological, it's sociological, because as soon as we start doing that, we start polarizing, we create uh, alliances among us, which is also will po polarize and create as big differences possible in order to mobilize uh, ourselves. So what's interesting is kind of what to find alternative to that, uh, to this kind of process. And uh, first of all, maybe knowing about that, that we prone to that, maybe not to allow to, to do that when we notice uh, on about ourselves. <coughs> and um, uh, like, for example, uh, Bakhtin was what talking about again that philosopher, Russian philosopher, is about to finding a boundary of the truth, and which is not inter uh, interesting. So instead of trying to get <laughs> what he called internal territory of the truth, is really to get which is that exactly what creates this in a way by what Bachson described. By the way, they don't know about each other clearly, uh, although they lived in the same time. Uh, and it's actually a focus on the boundary of the, your own truth, uh, not any, somebody's truth also, but primary about uh, your own truth. Um, and, uh, and that might be helpful because that's part of the dialogue when you start thinking that where is uh, the uh, boundary of my own truth, when my own truth becomes non-truth in another way. And another person can help you with that because um, another person with different, completely different positions uh, is his or she uh, can see your blind spots that you usually don't see it yourself. And in this case, that person is uh, helpful. By the way, there is a very interesting um, Belgium um, uh, political scientist. Uh, Anna, what's her first name? Do you remember? Uh, her last name is Mafia, and uh, let me spell ah, it. Mafia, uh, ma uh, but the, yeah, but what's her first name? Let me just, uh, uh, just a moment. Let me, um... She talks about um, pro, uh, uh, agonistic relations. It's an agonistic relations she defined as friendly enemies. So she was saying that a purpose of democratic politics is transform agonistic relations into, uh, I'm sorry, antagonistic relations to agonistic relations. Which is again, back to the, my previous point about how to leave strangers in peace. 
uh, but even not only how to live in peace, but in a way how to benefit from uh, strangers, how to appreciate strangers, not uh, while not becoming like them necessarily, while not building a community with them, but uh, appreciating them because they can help you to see your blind spots, which doesn't necessarily mean that you become like them, but it's they helpful to you. But in this case, you exploring the boundary of your own truth. They help you to explore them because they can see things that you don't see. And you, of course, can pay the same thing and explore, help them to explore their boundaries of the truth, their truth. But in this case, it might prevent from this, uh, what Anna, you're talking about, when people be getting in more, 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 uh, uh, saying things, outrageous things. They actually know that themselves they saying outrageous things, but they cannot even almost stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah, I also thought about uh, Conrad Lawrence, uh, maybe Elke Keys um, into ecology, yeah, mm, uh, studying animals' behavior. And he's a, he has a book on aggression, and uh, he states that uh, aggression is uh, like the backside of individuality. And for example, uh, the more uh, the more bright the species is, uh, like bright colored, like uh, fish, are very very multicolored and very beautiful uh, to us. Yeah. So the more aggressive they are, and uh, in part their individuality is. Uh, has a protective function. Yeah, so everyone sees it and no one wants to come closer. Uh, and uh, maybe vice, uh, vice versa. Yeah, so aggressions, uh, at least opposing positions, uh, they help us to um, find our own positions. Yeah, for example, I feel it very strongly right now during this uh, conflict that it uh, encouraged me to uh, search into myself and ask myself uh, what I think about it, what is my position. Uh, so maybe it's encouraging me to know myself better. Um, or maybe not, maybe it's pulling me to take some position which is not really mine, but it's one of the positions. Yeah, but um, still it is... Uh, uh, it, it is, yeah, it is encouraging to search inside ourselves. Yeah, I might say. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's been very, very educational. <laughs> very important the whole... what you're saying, yeah. Oh, sorry, Dean, okay. No, no problem. I'm just, uh, I have thought about how educational the whole thing is. It's awful. I'm being forced into this kind of deep dive and everybody is being forced into kind of so you thought very vaguely about something like you read some books you thought about it a little bit and now you're just being forced to form your own opinion and yeah. uh, nobody asked you and but you still have to well that's that's why also dialogue is so difficult in the contemporary schools uh, because it's anti uh, anti uh, monologic it it does force you to look at the differences not to look at how similar you are or how agreeable you are and find co collaboration but really look at the differences how are you different from everybody else what is your particular unique difference of everyone else and it is connected to, to 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 becoming a person as a unique person not just part of the big whole and 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 the contemporary progressive and co and uh, uh, conventional education are not about making differences it's about making unity making pieces of the same machine together working together that's one thing, but I want to continue, Dina. You part of this kind of process is like, for example, I notice what's going on right now. I can give you examples, although they for some people just prepare it can be painful to listen to that. But one thing that it's interesting, uh, I, I'm kind of noticed that uh, actually other people help me notice that that I'm kind of surprising myself because what I'm doing is very contradictory, 
And I can give you an example again, it will be painful. And some other people think, but you're contradicting what you're doing. And, uh, and, and it's true, I'm contradicting that. But I think that part of this taking responsibility for that contradiction is very important. I don't know if you want to listen to example or not, but just prepare that it can be painful. Do you want to listen to this example? Okay. So, so, but for example, what I found myself, I was one of this person who was lobbying my government, which is United States, for imposing sanctions, swift sanctions on Russia very early on. At the same time, what I found myself doing right now is to facilitating people in Russia exchange. So basically breaking this uh, embargo right now or uh, financial things and helping people to exchange uh, rubles to the currency, to the uh, Western currency like euro and dollars. And I'm doing that at the same time. And it's, uh, I was pointed on the Facebook that I'm contradicting this. And uh, uh, I stopped for a while to think about that and I kind of admit, taking responsibility for that the contradiction. In other words, I don't want to correct it. I think uh, I have to live with that contradiction. And, uh, and I will continue doing exactly, continue to be involved in more probably contradictions in, in, uh, in kind of on this case. I don't know if you want to ask about that or not, but... Um, I, I but don't I, think that's painful. I actually think that um, that can be very helpful to be contradictory because I find that if I, uh, like during these, what was it, two weeks, a lifetime anyway, it's um, whenever I found myself being very pro something or against something, that's when I felt I didn't like myself, when I was completely one-sided. But when I find myself in a weird position, in a contradictory position where I think this and also that, I, it makes it easier for me. Mm -hmm. It's complexity. Mm -hmm. mm, I prefer it to thinking that there are black people and white people. Right. Mm -hmm. No, part of that, what, uh, what actually I was thinking about my contradictions, it's like, yeah, it's, I feel it's very good that I uh, kind of, when I feel, for example, suffering, I'm start doing something that against my some uh, idea or calculations or whatever. And I can predict that. And I think that's how it should be. Uh, and not to allow me to be completely closed and to define even for myself, who am I? I think I sh it should be open. I don't know. I don't know what to expect from myself. I don't know what I will do next. And I'm not talking about uh, something that I do bad or mistakes. I'm not talking about that. Something even good, I don't know what it will be. That's something that will be, I don't know what's good is. And uh, it's still in searching and it's not, it's contextual in the particular circumstances and not in general statement. And this is in a way beauty of the life to find what's good in the, these particular moments, which might contradict what is good in another moment, in another time, in another things, or kind of more or less good on average. Mm -hmm. And what's bad about the war situation is that so many forces are pulling you to polarize all your complexities yeah. into one direction or into yeah. other direction and become very simple. Uh, there was a, a, I always, Eugene knows that, remember a statement of one very interesting person from Croatia. And he said that before, uh, during the beginning of the war, he says, until yesterday, I was known as whatever, Joe Schmo, uh, a curator of the uh, art museum, a very specialist in impressionists, especially uh, such a, such an impressionist, a good father and a bad husband, <laughs> and uh, a prospective <laughs> a grandfather or whatever. And he put a lot of love, but from, from uh, the beginning of the war, I'm known as a Croatian. Mm -hmm. Everything you collapsed. Know, the, one thing. Everything collapsed. It doesn't matter all this complexity mm -hmm. of his life. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, but I, it's on, not only that complexity that you can define, but it's open complexity that like mm -hmm. not knowing what will what you will do next and how much it will be contradictory to what you're doing like before. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean it's each time you need to define is it good or not good or to, like taking responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but rather than think about how consistent you are because mm -hmm. I don't think that consistent, sometimes consistency is important, but sometimes it's not. And exactly to why... this, uh, this thing what Anna was uh, with double N talking about to get that. By the way, Anna, I also not afraid of my emotions either. It's not like, okay, let's cut off our emotions and like with the cold mind, we can resolve everything. No, I think it's also can be very dangerous exactly because it can create this terrible consistency, very oppressive consistency. Just because you did this now, because that, you should do that. Mm -mm. It could be very wrong to do that. Yes, he it's fine and he it's not fine. No, you remove empathy and then you're done. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because That's the biggest, it. yeah, mm -hmm. that emotions, yes, it's true that sometimes they can be terrible uh, and they create terrible things. But on another hand, they, like Dina was saying that it's a part of the sympathy and empathy. It's a bit and love and caring and many of these things. They're very emotional. They should be like that. I, I'm afraid I need to get going. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, because yeah. I haven't seen my son in a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> talking about well, caring, you know, right? Talking about you know. caring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was just thinking, this brings us back to the first point that Eugene was making about irrational, rational and irrational. Yeah. And it, I think this is where rationality doesn't work in dialogue. So, yeah. Right? Yeah, that's well, what kind of, limited. Uh, it's limited. Yeah. Limited. Like anything yeah. else. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot again, Dina, for yeah. organizing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for our thank you. I really thank enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. And I'm very, yeah. very happy to have had this discussion. Yeah. I needed it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and everybody else, if you want to organize uh, like uh, another some kind of discussion or uh, even presentation you want to present something, feel free to do that. Uh, you can contact and we will tell you how to get, uh, how to do that just on organizational, organizationally wise. Okay. Uh, to send messages to people and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. But just don't let America have a change of time zone. In the yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And Canada. Yes. Uh, United States and Canada changed that. Yes. Right. Yesterday we we spring forward, as they say. We what was the, what was eight is now nine. You know, I think. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Well, nice seeing you and nice meeting you, Anna and uh, Olga. Disappeared, but yes. nice to meet her as well and everybody else. Nice to see you again. Nice. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.